Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Science in the Quran. We are continuing with the second part of our embryology series. As you remember, we were going through verse 14 of Surah Al-Mu'minun and we had already talked about the first part of the verse. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ثم خلقنا النطفة علقة فخلقنا العلقة مضغة فخلقنا المضغة عظاما فكسونا العظام لحما Now we would like to talk about this part of the verse ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين So let's focus on this part ثم أنشأناه خلقا آخر فتبارك الله أحسن الخالقين then we developed out of it another creature, so blessed be Allah, the best to create or the best of the creators. Now, this verse seems to discuss that in embryogenesis there are different stages. And indeed, this was also discussed by Professor Keith Moore, who you heard about last time. I quoted extensively from him. And if we notice, in the very early stages of the embryo, in the somite embryo stage, there's a great deal of similarity really between a reptile, a bird, and a human. Humans even have gill slits the way that fish do, and so do reptiles, and so do birds. And then as we change, so here is a tortoise, a chick, a rabbit, a human. Here's the very early stage of embryogenesis where they appear so similar. And then we are developed in different stages until we differentiate as human beings and become quite different from a tortoise or a chick. And so this verse in the Quran, or this portion of the verse rather, has been felt to describe the notion of the different stages of embryogenesis, that we start off as something and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us as something else. Now this is a very interesting point and Dr. Moore actually talks about how this notion of the embryo developing in stages is a very, very modern notion, and that the modern staging of human embryos didn't really come about until the 19th century and the 20th century, and certainly would not have been possible before the invention of the microscope. Before that, people probably thought that a human was created as a miniature fetus and then simply grew in the womb. This notion of entirely different stages of being is a very, very modern one that would have been impossible to know in um, 7th century Arabia and certainly was not known in the Middle Ages. Now let's go to another verse. This is verse 6 from Surah to zumar Surah 39. And what... Um, I would like to do here is just focus on one portion of the verse. It is talking about how we have been created from a single soul, a single person, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates from it its mate, and that he also sends down uh, different uh, types of cattle. And then here is our portion of interest. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يخلقكم في بطون أمهاتكم خلقا من بعد خلق في ظلمات ثلاث that he creates you in the wombs of your mothers in stages one after the other we have already talked about that in uh, the verse from Surah Al-Mu'minun that we were just discussing then this verse adds in three veils of darkness that we undergo this multi-stage embryogenesis and three veils of darkness. And, in fact, Professor Moore, in his article, A Scientist's Interpretation of References to Embryology in the Quran, says, and I quote directly from him once again, the three veils of darkness may refer to the anterior abdominal wall of the mother, then the wall of the uterus, and then the amniochorionic membrane, the sac where the amniotic fluid sits, and the baby is inside that amniotic sac. And so he says, although there are other interpretations of this statement, the one presented here seems the most logical from an embryological point of view. And he was quite amazed that the Quran is talking about these three different layers or three different veils of darkness. And of course, the fetus is entirely in darkness at uh, 
uh, this stage. And that's why when babies are born, they're really not able to see. And it takes several weeks for the brain to myelinate the occipital cortex, which is the visual part of the brain. And that's about when a baby begins to be able to focus. Now, Surat Asajda, Surah 32, verse 9, also talks about something that Professor Moore finds quite interesting, which is the stage, the staging of the development of the different faculties of the fetus. And so the verse says, ثم سواه ونفخ فيه من روحه وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة قليلا ما تشكرون. But he fashioned him in due proportion and breathed into him something of his spirit, and he gave you the faculties of hearing and sight and feeling or understanding. Little thanks do you give. And again, I quote directly from Professor Moore. As I said, I'm going to have the luxury here of having him do the heavy lifting once again because he is an internationally recognized professor of anatomy and embryology. His textbooks in anatomy and embryology are very widely used in medical schools in the U.S. And he says this part of Surah 32 9 indicates that the special senses of hearing, seeing, and feeling develop in this order, which is true. The primordia of the internal ears appear before the beginning of the eyes, and the brain, i.e. the sight of understanding, differentiates last. And so we see that there's really a great deal of subtlety in verses that we may not have paused to think about in this way. And as we learn something about embryology, we are truly amazed by what the Quran says. Now, let's take a look at sort of the overall view of creation, of the life of the human. And so, in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْدٍ مِّنَ الْبَعْثِ فَإِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِّن تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ مِن نُطْفَةٍ ثُمَّ مِن عَلَقَةٍ ثُمَّ مِن مُضْغَةٍ مُخَلَّقَةٍ وَغَيْرِ مُخَلَّقَةٍ لِنُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ وَنُقِرُّ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ مَا نَشَاءُ إِلَى أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى ثُمَّ نُخْرِجُكُمْ طِفْلًا ثُمَّ لِتَبْلُغُوا أَشُدَّكُمْ وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُتَوَفَّى وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرَدُّ إِلَى أَرْضَ لِلْعُمُرِ لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَمَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عِلْمٍ شَيْئًا And I will stop here with the Arabic. And now let's translate. O oh mankind, if you have a doubt about the resurrection, consider that we created you out of dust, then out of sperm, then out of a leech-like clot, and we've already clarified that alaqa does not mean a, a clot. It could mean a leech, or it could mean something which dangles, which is its primary meaning, the way the embryo does in the blastocyst stage, then out of a morsel of chewed flesh, that's the mudra, and partly formed and partly unformed. And we'll get back to that in a second. مُخَلَّقَةٍ وَغَيْرِ مُخَلَّقًا In order that we may manifest our power to you, and we cause whom we will to rest in the wombs for an appointed term, then do we bring you out as babes, then foster you that ye may reach your age of full strength, and some of you are called to die, and some are sent back to the feeblest old age, so that they know nothing after having known much, and this would of course be the stage of dementia that sometimes besets the very elderly. So, Professor Moore then talks about two parts of this verse. One is this notion of a chewed lump of flesh, which is partly formed and partly unformed. And what he says about that, and so here's that somite embryo. In his article, once again, a scientist's interpretation of references to embryology in the Quran, then out of a piece of chewed flesh, partly formed and partly unformed. This part of Surah 22.5 seems to indicate that the embryo is composed of both differentiated and undifferentiated tissues, for example, when the cartilage and bones are differentiated, the embryonic connective tissue or mesenchyme around them is, is undifferentiated. It later differentiates into muscles and ligaments attached to the bones. And so that is his interpretation of that portion of the verse. Again, an absolutely amazing insight into the Quran. I'm not saying this is what the Quran definitively meant, but I'm saying that it may have meant that, but at least now we can understand it in a very, very sophisticated way that really brings out 
the majesty of the Quran. And then Professor Moore goes back to talk about this portion of the verse. That we cause whom we will to rest in the wombs for an appointed term. This next part of Surah 22.5 seems to imply that God determines which embryos will remain in the uterus until full term. And then he goes on to say that it is well known that many embryos abort during the first month of development and that only about 30% of zygotes that form develop into fetuses that survive until birth. Now this is amazing because this is a very, very modern discovery. In the 7th century, even in the 17th century, these fertilized zygotes would simply have failed to implant in the uterus and the woman would have a normal or nearly normal period and not even realize that she was pregnant. This notion that so many fertilized ova, so many potential embryos do not remain in the uterus and that God decides who will rest in the wombs for their appointed term and survive until birth, this is a very, very new and modern notion that the Quran is stating outright. So all of these things together led Professor Moore and should now lead us to the same conclusion that, and I quote directly from him and we'll end here inshallah, the interpretation of the verses in the Quran referring to human development would not have been possible in the 7th century AD or even a hundred years ago. We can interpret them now because the science of modern embryology affords us new understanding. Undoubtedly, there are other verses in the Quran related to human development that will be understood in the future as our knowledge increases. And there is nothing really I can add to that except subhanallah and salamu alaikum. We'll see you next time, inshallah.